And so when I look at this text in Joshua chapter 1 and Joshua chapter 3, I see a word here for those of you who are looking at an unsettled future, who are dealing with issues of ambiguity in your personal life, in your ministry, in your marriage, in your finances. There's a word from the Lord in our text. As the book of Joshua opens, the Hebrew nation is camped along the east bank of the river Jordan. They're at the very edge of the promised land, and they have just completed the mourning period for Moses, their leader who had just died. This is the land that was promised to them. It's the land that God had decided. In fact, it was God's idea to give them the land in the first place. And so the problem here was when they got close enough to receive the promise, they retreated. You see, 39 years earlier, after spending a year at Mount Sinai and receiving God's revelation, the Israelites were presented with the same opportunity that they now have in Joshua 1. But they failed to trust God. They looked and they saw the sons of Anak. They saw the giants. They saw the parasites. They saw the Gergesites. They saw the Amalekites. Somebody said they may have even saw the termites. <laughs> and they said, we look like grasshoppers in our own sight. And as a result, a journey that should have taken 7 to 11 days wound up taking 40 years. And they wandered in the desert, defeated in their minds by an enemy. Watch this, that never shot at them. So, so the first point I need to make is to encourage you not to be defeated by the threat of your enemy. Don't be defeated by an enemy that never fires a shot. They wandered 40 years defeated by an enemy that never fired a shot, never mounted a campaign against them. In other words, the warfare they anticipated was all in their minds. They doubted what God could do that God could match their assignment and accomplish what he promised. They refused to enter the promised land and their disobedience resulted in God's judgment so that none of the adults except Caleb and Joshua would enter into the land of promise. Now we fast forward to Joshua chapter 1 and it's 40 years later. God's ready to lead them to the place that he has promised them in Genesis chapter 12. It's a time of transfer and transition. Transfer of property and transition of their lives. And I just came by to tell somebody that God's got you at the same point of transfer and transition. Oh God, somebody should have celebrated that right there. Moses is dead, but even though he died, God's intentions uh, didn't fall apart. In other words, what God wants us to know is that even though our lives and ministries are impacted and shaped by others, our ministries don't die when they die. When they move off the scene, when they walk out of our lives, uh, the vision didn't die when Moses died. And may I tell you something here? Stop fretting and mourning and complaining that somebody walked out your life. Somebody's not your friend anymore. Somebody betrayed you. Somebody did you wrong. You ought to be glad that they left you while you were still in the wilderness because they were never meant to go with you into the promised land in the first place. Moses was just the executor of the vision, but the vision came from God. Your destiny does not depend on what somebody else does. Your destiny does not depend on somebody else giving you a heads up or the hook up. God can do it all by himself. So along comes Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses' aide, who worked and functioned, watch this, in the background of Scripture during most of the Exodus journey. He was one of the 12 spies who surveyed the land, brought back a good report. Joshua was an octogenarian at this point. And what you got to understand is Joshua was happy serving in the background. I'm going somewhere here. God deliver me from Christians uh, who always got to be in the forefront. Uh, 
you got to understand that if you don't know how to serve in the background, you don't have any right to be up in the front. Uh, oh, if I were a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, uh, read your Bible in Genesis, he's in the background. Exodus, he's in the background. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. But then all of a sudden, at the right time, God puts him right up front. Would you tell somebody promotion doesn't come from the north, from the south, from the east or the west, uh, but it come from God. He that exalt himself shall be a base, uh, but he that humble himself shall be exalted. Touch your neighbor, ask your neighbor, can you work in the back ground. Uh, if you can serve God when nobody's looking, when nobody's calling your name, when nobody's giving you accolades, uh, when nobody's giving you honor, then you're in a position for God to bring you to the forefront. And so here he is, 80 years old. Oh, that's another message in itself. Because some of you have been there waiting for a long time. And you thought that because it didn't come your way yet, that you missed your season. But here he is at 80 years old. He has confidence, even though he doesn't have the same amount of strength. He was a covert spy 40 years before. Uh, uh, he was not intimidated by the giants, but here he is 80 plus years old, and somebody might say he's not in any condition to assemble a major military campaign. And if the truth were told, the rank and file in the congregation would have probably opted to evacuate and retreat under somebody that old. But that brings me to my second point. Would you look at somebody and tell them uh, uh, it may not be your turn but it yet can be your time uh, so you've got to understand uh, that if it's not my turn it ain't really about my turn it's really about God's timing when it's God's time it doesn't matter that it's not your turn because in the wisdom of God his timing is always right time you see my sisters and brothers we operate off chronos time hours and minutes and seconds and we count the clock and the years and the months as they pass by but God operates off of Kairos time and Kairos time is the opportune time it's the right time God knew that he couldn't bring you into your promise back then because you weren't ready then I know I lost some folk in the house right now. You didn't have enough patience. You didn't have enough common sense. You would not know what to do if you had been blessed back then. You would have messed the blessing back up. God had to bring you through some stuff so that God could prepare you for the right time. Uh, uh, my grandmama used to bake. And, and, and when I was a little boy, and what she would do, she would send us to the oven uh, to check the cake. She would send us there uh, with a fork and, and we'd have to stick the fork in the cake and, and, and if batter came up on the fork it wasn't ready yet. But if the fork came up clean the cake was ready. Now, 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 now if you had taken the cake out before it was ready and you tried to cut a piece, uh, the piece would not be firm enough to stand up on its own because it was still soft and liquefied on the inside. The problem with many of us uh, is we can't stand the heat of the oven. It's too hot in this oven. It's too dark in this oven. Uh, it's too confined and constraining in this oven and we want to get out the oven before we're done and so when the knife of adversity enters our life we can't stand up on our own you want to touch somebody and say stay there in the oven until God get through with you I promise this is the last time I'm going to tell y'all to sit down. 
So they're on the edge of the land that flowed with milk and honey. They're at the place where, metaphorically speaking, milk and honey represent economic and agricultural wealth. Things are finally getting ready to shift, getting ready to turn around. They had missed their window of opportunity once, but God is giving them another chance. And I just wonder today, is there anybody here in Raleigh, North Carolina, glad that God is a God of another chance? Oh, I, 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 I don't know about you, but I'm glad God waited on me to catch up. Uh, I, I'm glad that when I was acting a fool and acting crazy and didn't have sense enough to want to be saved and was trying to be wonderful and on my way to an unproductive life that God gave me another chance. <laughs> And I know some of you have been in church all your life and, and, and you came up uh, speaking in tongues and you received the Holy Ghost from your mama's womb and you got dropped off a hallelujah boulevard, took off your wings and halo for a season. But there's some of us uh, that needed another change. Mm. <laughs> And somebody came up hearing that God was a God of a second chance, but I came to announce that that's bad theology uh, because I messed up my second chance the same week I got saved. Uh, oh, God help me in here. And I messed up my third and my fourth and my 59th and my 75th and my 89th and my 1,365th chance. I'm so glad that God is a God. Somebody scream another chance. So God left the window open, a journey that should take 11 days. And some of these battles, sisters and brothers, we ought not still be fighting. Some of these demons we ought to have conquered by now. Some of these folk we feel like cussing out, we ought to be finished with by now. At some point, you got to graduate from what folk do. Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, took his boys with him, his road dogs, his ace boon coons, his ride or die folk with him. He said, now, I need y'all to just watch. I'm going to pray. You ain't even got to pray. Just watch. I'm going to pray. He went to pray, came back, and the boys were asleep. And Jesus said, what could you not just watch but one hour? went back and prayed again came back and the boys had went to sleep again he said indeed the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak went back and prayed the third time and when he came back he said sleep on take your rest he had gotten strengthened by God and it didn't matter what his boys did you ought to be at a point by now that it don't matter what Sally Sue, Shafika, Roshana Tyrone, Jerome or none of them do you ought to say sleep on uh, take your rest uh, I'm going on with the Lord some point God ought not have to bring you through the same battle uh, oh my God some folk just like being in remedial class uh, but there's a window open right now tell your neighbor climb on through climb on through climb on through I got to bring this to a close, but here's what I like about God. Although it took 40 years to get where it could have taken only 11 days, God's promise was still good. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is that if God promised it, my final point, the enemy can't block my blessing if God promised it. <laughs> The only thing I can do is to forfeit my blessing, but God is still ready to do the same thing for them 40 years later that he was ready to do 40 years before. And somebody ought to praise God that no matter what you've been through in life, God still.
still has good plans for your life. Uh, oh, I made some mistakes, but he got good plans. Uh, I fell short of his glory, but he got good plans. Uh, I sinned against him. I messed up, but he got good plans. Uh, you dropped out of school, but he got good plans. Got hooked on drugs, but he got good plans. Wound up pregnant before time, but God still got good plans. And so now God is ready to do what he intended to do. They're ready to transition into fruitful and productive living. And so the narrative opens after the death of Moses, which reminds me that the fruitful and productive living was not dependent on Moses. So God recommissions Joshua in the conquest of the land west of the Jordan. And watch this, what he says to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous as I was with Moses I'll be with you wherever you go I'm going to be there but here's what blows my mind God makes all of these lofty promises before they can possess the land they've got to cross the Jordan River before they can transition into fruitful and productive living they got to cross the Jordan there's no doubt that they wanted to enter into economic and agricultural prosperity, but they had something in front of them that was hindering their way. In other words, my sisters and my brothers, God knew in chapter 1 when he made the promise that they were going to face the Jordan in chapter 3. But God never said anything about the Jordan. If God is omniscient, God, if he exercises providence, if he sees in advance, he had to know that the Jordan was there. And the Bible said that the river was at flood times. In other words, it was 12 to 15 feet higher than it normally was, which in essence means that it was physically impossible for them to get across. But yet and still God tells them, to get across the river. Why would God do that? I'm here to tell you that God chooses the timing of this crossing because God wanted the folk who were looking at his people to understand that he had water parting abilities. He wanted everybody watching to know the kind of God that they served. Uh, you see, God didn't let you get to this point in your life so you can fail. Uh, he let you get here so everybody around you could see the kind of God uh, that you serve. Uh, he wanted folk to know that you serve a miracle working God. Uh, a God that can do anything but fail. Uh, so the order today is not to throw your pity party, but it's to cancel your pity party. Throw your head back. Let's just go to E flat, brother. There we are, right there. Cancel your pity party.